Hello. This lecture is uh, entitled Pedagogy, Andragogy and Transformative Change and its purpose is to provoke some thought about the role of educators, uh, our role as university educators and what our function and purpose is with respect to students' development as professionals. And we're going to do that by uh, looking at pedagogy and andragogy as concepts looking at the learning theory uh, called transformative learning and then touch on some more radical ideas by Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks uh, and ask what our purpose and our function is with respect to developing our students particularly as professionals. If you're observing the lecture in the context of the PG Cert then it meets two of the objectives uh, for EDU 7003, in which we've said we would look uh, at some previously encounters theoretical perspectives and uh, particularly compare them to androg uh, andragogy. And secondly, uh, that we would look at adult learning theory, particularly transformative learning theory, and in the process uh, synthesize some previous work on deep surface and strategic approaches. As you go through this lecture, uh, it would be really helpful if you consider, and by all means make personal notes, consider the concept of the professional uh, and perhaps into professional learning and think about your learning needs, your learning styles, your learning preferences uh, and those of your students and ask yourself whether professional learning as you experience it as an educator is professional learning andragogical or pedagogical and why might that be? So at its very simplest, people often talk about pedagogy as being about children and andragogy as being about adults. And that, that's an oversimplification, but it's not a million miles away from the truth. Certainly by definition, there is a sense in which uh, pedagogy is, de by definition, to lead the child, and andragogy, by definition, to lead the man. Uh, if you're interested in the Greek entomology, uh, it's uh, all available online. But Essentially, this distinction, this difference between pedagogy and andragogy is, is based on a body of, of theoretical work, a body of research, the boundaries of which over the last 30 or 40 years have become somewhat blurred. So if we focus for a moment on pedagogy, pedagogy as an idea is concerned with a sequential development. It comes from development theory, it comes from experiments uh, carried out with young children at school level, particularly the early work of uh, Piaget, uh, it, working with school with children at, at primary school level and younger, kindergarten, and explored the way in which they built knowledge up through a process of recognition, of recall, of, uh, of analysis and so on. And this will tally with work uh, elsewhere that we've covered looking at educational taxonomies. You'll see this same sense of progression, development, of scaffolding learning. The intention within uh, a pedagogical framework is that the teacher essentially provides the assistance that the learner actually needs to go through this scaffolding process. So everything is structured in such a way as to assume a degree of control and a degree of sequence. Andragogy as a concept is somewhat different. It suggests, mostly on the basis of work by Malcolm Knowles, although that work itself is, uh, has much deeper roots, uh, again in educational psychology but also in aspects of social theory, that actually suggests that the learner develops through a process of self-aware interaction, that, that the individual is aware that they're learning, they have the, the, the need to learn, they have a requirement to learn something, and that they learn best when they can then make adaptations and adjustments of whatever experiential learning they encounter and draw that back to prior experience, uh, make decisions for themselves, that they engage with the learning process and that it isn't sequential, it isn't necessarily linear, it's based on a particular set of conditions and so everyone's learning requirements are different. Now I want to go through work that if you're on the PG Cert you will have covered already uh, just to remind ourselves what that difference between pedagogy and andragogy is. So you can skip these next slides if you feel that you've got got the idea, but they're provided here uh, as a kind of revision session. 
So a simple way of distinguishing between these two concepts is to look at them through a number of different lenses. If we look at them from the perspective of the learner, then in pedagogy it's often suggested that the learner is dependent on the tutor for the learning, that the tutor assumes full responsibility and that the tutor ultimately is evaluating the learning and directing the student to the next step depending on their own performance. As opposed to andragogy where a learner is self-directed, they have responsibility and they undertake a degree of self-evaluation of learning, perhaps deciding whether to review a concept again and again and again or whether to move on to something new. So look at your own practice and ask yourself whether what you do in the classroom is truly pedagogical, truly andragogical or somewhere in between. Then we can look at the role of learner experience in terms of pedagogy and andragogy. So in pedagogical terms we might suggest that the learner has very little experience that can be tapped into and is wholly dependent on the tutor as opposed to an andragogical concept where the learner brings with them experience that's tapped into and indeed learners themselves become resources for each other. Where there are differences in those experiences that creates an opportunity for further learning. Diversity in experience is seen as a, a good thing, uh, not as making a class difficult to teach but rather as providing opportunities for teaching. And importantly, and we'll come on to this in a moment, experience is something that uh, helps to develop a sense of the learner's self-identity, that if they can identify their experience and articulate their experience as the basis for future learning, that helps them uh, in, in many ways to learn in a more meaningful sense. We also have a distinction in terms of the individual's readiness to learn between pedagogy and andragogy. In pedagogy it's often suggested that students need to be told what to learn, uh, indeed they might have to be told to learn at all, uh, and that they're actually told how to advance, how to progress, the steps are laid out for them individually, as opposed to an andragogical concept where essentially it's some need of change, some sense that there is a requirement to learn that actually triggers that readiness to learn and need to know becomes central to that individual's sense of their own identity and their own development. They want to be a particular profession, they want to be a chiropractor, they want to be an accountant and their need to know is about fulfilling that sense of identity. The individual has the ability to look at gaps in their own knowledge and their own experience and decide where they want to encounter learning. Now again, it would be useful for you to be looking at these differences and saying, how do you teach? Are you teaching in a pedagogical concept or are you teaching within an andragogical uh, framework? What, where are you as a teacher? Where are your learners? Are they waiting to be told? Are they able to identify their gaps and plan their own learning? How does this play out in your personal experience? Then we can look at pedagogy and andragogy through an orientation to learning. So pedagogically, learning is a process of acquiring something that the tutor already has. The tutor's decided what the subject matter is and the content is sequenced in such a way as to make the subject more understandable within whatever the discipline conventions are, but it's controlled by the teacher. As opposed to in an andragogical idea where the learner actually decides to engage with the learning must have already deemed it to be relevant in order to want to orientate themselves to that learning and that they will manage and organize that learning around life and work rather than around the subject matter itself. And finally the idea that the motivation is different between pedagogy and andragogy that primary motivation for within the pedagogical framework will be one where essentially there are external pressures, a requirement to go to school, but perhaps also a fear of failure, competition for grades and so on, as opposed to an andragogical idea of something internal where there is a, a strong sense of self-actualization, a strong desire to grow as an individual. And again, I'd ask you to think about your own classrooms, think about your own practice and ask whether in fact what you're doing is pedagogical or andragogical. Now one way of summing this up is to look at Malcolm Knowles who's often thought of as this, I say the founder of this notion of uh, andragogy and he identifies four dominant themes that within an andragogical framework adults need to be involved in the planning and evaluation of instruction that their personal experience, including mistakes they've made, is a basis for learning activity, that they are most interested in subjects 
which are immediately relevant to them, and that adult learning at its best is problem-centered rather than content-orientated. Now, it would be interesting to think about each of those four and think about a typical class that you teach and ask whether, in fact, do those facets of adult learning feature in your classrooms. What I want to look at now is something that's related. So we've talked a little bit about pedagogy and andragogy. That was a revision session, essentially. And I now want to think about something called transformative learning theory. So this is a theory developed in the 1980s by someone called Jack Mesereau, and it's been much talked about, much critiqued, and there's a number of uh, writers that have done work and development on this since. This was work that originally focused around women returning to work after long periods of absence from formal education, and he studied the way in which they learned effectively as adults. And he found or he identified these 10 stages to transformative learning, where a student experienced some kind of disorientating dilemma, went through a process of self-examination of doubt, and as a consequence a feeling of alienation or sometimes inadequacy, that sometimes that was then projected or related to uh, anger in some ways, discontent with others, changing anger at the way the world had changed and perhaps left them out uh, of, of whatever developments they had identified, that they then start to find ways in which they could justify be changing their behaviour and they build confidence in those new ways of behaving. They plan a way to engage, to, to overcome the disorientating dilemma and its consequences. They develop the skills to implement those plans. They go through a period of experimenting with some new position, some new frame of reference that they've developed as a result of this process. And they then reintegrate that new learning into their practice. And this research has been quite widely debated, uh, particularly in the terms of adult learning and lifelong learning for quite some time. And you can analyze this in many different ways and, and sometimes it's something very obviously disruptive like uh, the loss of a home or a, or a divorce or something that has changed one's concept of the loss of a child something very obviously uh, disruptive and you can see a pattern or a parallel between this kind of idea of personal learning transformative learning um, and many of the kind of counselling theories and, and ideas that were circulating in the 1980s as well. But it's been very powerful in educational terms and it raises some quite interesting issues about the degree to which you design learning in order to achieve personal transformation. Do we challenge and disorientate our learners at the outset? Do we seek to disavow them of any misconceptions they have? Do we look to disrupt their assumptions and then take them through this process? Or do we treat them as though they're empty vessels with no pre-existing uh, pre ideas and so we don't feel any obligation to challenge them? What's interesting is when you take this as an idea and you explore it in terms of uh, particular approaches to learning, you come up with something quite interesting, different strategies that can be used to intervene at different levels of this transformative learning process if you believe that this process exists. And so you can see examples here on the screen where one might use uh, particular learning strategies, learning and teaching strategies to respond to each level of uh, the, the, the transformative process. Now, one of the things, again, I would encourage you to be thinking about is the degree to which you currently do some of these things within your classrooms, that you run scenarios, that you do case study building, that you do role play, and ask the extent to which you have fitted those uh, learning and teaching strategies into some kind of framework of education, or whether, in fact, it's just what you do. So I encourage you to think about whether or not transformative learning is evidenced in your classrooms, and if so, how and why. Now, transformative learning has been criticised, um, not least uh, for what's often regarded as a very clinical and procedural uh, approach, which simply doesn't bear out in the vast majority of cases. And certainly, as with a lot of research, 
you synthesize the data that you've got to such an extent that it no longer represents a real experience for anyone. So it's been suggested, for example, by Dirks that uh, writing collaboratively with Mesro, Mesro has been very, very open to criticism of his own research and his own model. And it's been suggested that it simply doesn't take account of all of the very emotional, the affective dimension um, of learning, that it that it's too cognitive. And that, again, this refers back to the work that we've already done with educational taxonomies uh, at the beginning of Module 3 of the PG CERT. Uh, the idea that somehow transformative learning really is just too rational a, a, an explanation and that it's almost never experienced in that very procedural way. So those are, are valid criticisms, but it doesn't uh, invalidate, I think, the idea that there is a disruptive transformative experience that people have in many circumstances when their assumptions about a particular uh, subject or a particular idea um, are, are challenged, disrupted. Uh, how do they respond? What process do they go through? And it raises an interesting question about what our role is, which is at the crux of what we're talking about here is what is our role? Is our role to support students to recognize those assumptions and disrupt them, to actively disrupt them? Is it our, is it our role to provoke? Uh, and to what extent do we have a role of guiding learners through that process of discovery with reference to themselves? And where is the boundary then between being a, a counsellor and being a, a teacher and educator. And it's in that context that I think uh, it's useful to think about just how radical our roles might be. And this is a, a little bit of an excursion into philosophy, but I think it's important to consider what our role might be, given that increasingly the content that we used to be the guardians of that we used to essentially uh, have in our possession and that students came to us for that content knowledge that they no longer need to come to us for the vast majority of that content knowledge. Uh, you hear more and more people say that it's, it's all on Wikipedia or it's all available on the internet. There's a YouTube video for practically everything. Why would I go to class when I can download a much more succinct 12 minute version of something than go to a seminar for an hour? And it's in that context that I just want to challenge you to be thinking about different types of radical education and different thinkers, different theoreticians who have posited uh, education in perhaps a different way. And some of you may recognize the names. Some of, some of this will be new to you. The first is uh, Paulo Freire, who's a uh, Brazilian, uh, the late Paulo Freire, who uh, has been very influential on a whole generation of educational planners and philosophers. And he basically sees the existing pedagogies or saw the existing pedagogies that were prevalent in the 70s and 80s as reinforcing the notion of the, the disadvantage by identifying learners as empty vessels, as having nothing and needing to be educated, that there was almost an immediate subjugation of the learner in a way that was, was very negative. And he, just, he talks about the banking concept. So there's this quote here that education essentially transforms students into receiving objects. It attempts to control their thinking and action and leads men and women to adjust to the world. It inhibits their creative power. This idea that education is about conformity that education is not in any way value neutral, that you aren't just delivering content, that any piece of content has associated with it any number of uh, epistemological concerns, any number of political ideas, uh, all kinds of social, moral labels, baggage that, that go with it, and that you aren't just ever teaching content, that it's the process itself that is potentially liberating. So Paulo Freire has been very um, controversial, uh, but is also widely quoted and uh, talked about in terms of educational policy and development as people have tried to find ways of coping with uh, social change uh, and in some cases, social disruption through education. <laughs> 
The second uh, individual that I think some of you may find very interesting to engage with uh, is an American uh, who writes under the name of Bell Hooks and uh, a little bit like uh, Cummings is, is always spelt with lowercase so they're not it's not misspelling when you see uh, Bell Hooks spelt all lowercase. Uh, her name's Gloria Jean Watkins. She's a, an, an author and educator, uh, a feminist philosopher, uh, a black activist in the United States, uh, an, an advocate of a great many uh, social causes and, and basically tries in her work to link all of these things together. She's a very wide-ranging writer and a very holistic thinker. And she sees the classrooms in which we teach as potentially places of, of social constraint, places of subjugation, as does Frere, but also of potential liberation. And what she's arguing is that students uh, and teachers need to come to an understanding of what the nature of that power relationship is, and that teachers need to give up control, give up power over students in order to liberate students' inquiry, uh, their creativity, their enthusiasm. And so she talks about transgression. Her most influential book is Teaching to Transgress. And she's essentially saying you have to challenge these boundaries, you have to confront assumptions, and that classrooms are wonderfully safe and productive places in which the roles of students and teachers can be reversed, in which students can challenge absolutely everything about the world in which they live and come to some kind of new way uh, of thinking. And that doing so makes everybody more engaged and through engagement you develop community and through community you develop a, effectively a, a much better and healthier society. And you can see parallels between what Hooks is saying here and some of those ideas that Jack Mesro has about the, the value of starting the educational process through disruption. So whether we think about it in terms of disruptive dilemmas, whether we think about it in terms of Frere's critical pedagogy or we think about Bell Hooks's transgression, essentially we do need to ask ourselves the question as to what our role for students is. How do students currently perceive us and do they perceive us accurately? Are we social critics or are we simply perpetuating whatever the conventional power structures and authority in our particular discipline or profession is? Uh, and are we in the business of freeing up our students' minds or having those minds conform to the particular professional environment in which they're going because we feel we know best or because we understand that landscape and they want to join it or become members of it? And is that important? Is it important to us as educators to know what our role is? These ideas are quite far-reaching. None of these uh, books are, uh, or articles are required reading on the PG Cert, but they are interesting for those of you that want to follow them up. Um, Frere and Hooks are interesting and provocative reads uh, and always worth, worth looking at. <laughs>